Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. This is the uh, Cinco de Mayo edition of the uh, City of San Diego Commission on Police Practices uh, Ad Hoc Transition Planning Committee meeting. Uh, I'll call the roll. I'm Doug Case. I am the chair of the committee and first chair of the commission. We have Brandon Hilpert, who is the chair of the commission. We have our community outreach um, chair, uh, Patrick Anderson, who also a member of the committee, and uh, Nancy Vaughn, member of the committee. Uh, we have uh, our outside counsel, Dwayne Bennett, joining us today. Uh, we have Elena Conde, who is our executive assistant. And we have Liz Bratt from the City Human Relations Department. And then we have David Neimeyer, who is from our executive search firm. And, I forgot uh, one, Diana. Oh, I'm sorry, because she's right in the middle. <laughs> and uh, Diana Dantu is uh, a member of the committee. Thank you. And was there any public comment? I'm guessing not. Yeah, I don't think there was any public comment. Okay, uh, why don't you go ahead and share the agenda? Okay, and I need to uh, leave by four thirty today, so I'm going. We may uh, change the agenda around a little bit so we can get to our new business and then go back to the. Uh, to the old business, uh, the budget process, uh, our budget to hearing before the uh, city council, it's actually the budget review committee, which is the council meeting as a whole is on Tuesday. And uh, we're doing a dry run on Monday. Uh, Brendan, did you get the link to that? Uh, I did, yeah. Okay. Do you need it? Yeah, because Jocelyn uh, didn't send it to me and I asked for it and then she said, I sent it to you. <laughs> Yeah, the, the I'll, I'll forward it to you. Okay. And uh, staffing executive searches for the executive director. We'll talk about that in just a second. And then our other three positions. Uh, the information that I got from Charmaine is that uh, in order to, uh, uh, well, there's two ways of doing the uh, executive searches. Uh, we can do all four of the ones that we have planned as a uh, packet uh, and do an RFP, uh, or we can uh, do them independently or separately uh, as they come up, uh, as long as we keep uh, the cost uh, less than uh, $25,000. So if it's less than $25,000, uh, we can uh, do it without going through the RFP process, which would speed it up. We just have to get uh, two bids and make at least two bids and make a selection from, from those individuals or those firms. Um, I don't know if she got an answer to the not, whether or not we were able to use Dave's firm for any of them or not. Uh, it didn't say in the, uh, in the text. And so we'll have to ask her when she, she's able to join us. Um, personally, I think it probably makes sense just to do them one at a time, rather than trying to do an RFP, because we also don't know uh, what the uh, time frame is going to be for all four of them. And so I'll just leave it at that for the time being. Uh, nothing new on uh, operating the uh, implementation ordinance or standard operating procedures, uh, other than we did hear that the meet and confer has begun. That's all we know. Um, really nothing new to report on office space. So we did get a uh, response uh, to the uh, proposal that was sent by uh, the Department of Real Estate. Uh, and uh, we'll be giving a response to that. Uh, nothing new on standing rules. Anything new on community outreach, Patrick? I think we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, right? Right. The, uh, and so, the community panel, yeah. Right. And, uh, and then not, no meetings uh, with the mayor and the city council. Member. And so since David is here, maybe David can give us an update of where we stand on the executive search. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Doug. So um, our ads uh, are all live with the exception of the Elotino classified, which we did um, approve getting that uh, for some mineral next week. 
So uh, they, they're all live. We've received, as of this morning, we've had 28 applicants, which is, again, I think really good considering we're just starting the advertising and we still have three weeks to go. Uh, in terms of the community survey, uh, we, we're still a little slow. As of last night, it was 13 responses. My understanding is I think Charmaine was still working on getting the link on the website. And obviously once that out, and I think certainly the publicity we're getting, I think will, will help that too. Uh, but we've, we extended the survey deadline uh, until the end, uh, two weeks from tomorrow. So we still have some, a lot of time for that. But that's, that's it really the next couple of weeks, we'll be working on outreach in terms of candidates that have expressed interest. I've talked to a number of them already and we'll be doing more of that over the next week or two and uh, kind of pushing the citizen survey out. So that, that will be our focus. Cool. Okay. And anything you want to add, Liz? Um, I, I have an idea about your overall like search plan. Um, I was out of the office this past week, so I'm catching up and was, I was excited to see it got launched. And I do know the position got posted on San Diego.gov, um, I believe yesterday on our personnel website. Let me see here. Um, so if you go on San Diego.gov and um, let's see, and you look at employment opportunities, um, I want to apply apply for a job city job opportunity and then you click apply now and then you click on open jobs. I say by the way, Kate is uh, in the attendee list now, so she's here to be added. Liz, if your your microphone's off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I put it back on. Sorry. I. A plane going over me. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, Deputy Executive Director of the Commission. So it is posted on San Diego.gov um, uh, as well. And I was going to ask actually David and, and the Commission do you think there's any, like, could the Commission have any economy of scale by consolidating the searches and doing them simultaneously? Um, in my experience, occasionally there's a candidate where, who might interview for one position and who actually is actually a really good fit for another position you might have in the wings. And given the overlap and similarity, I don't know if that's like something that the commission already had discussed, but I just was thinking maybe there's a way to do some of the searches simultaneously. Um, and there, if there's an opportunity for cost saving or time saving or, um, maybe a better pool, a larger pool of people since if you could do them simultaneously. Just a thought um, for consideration. I, I mean, from CPS states is our perspective, it, it, it doesn't make too much difference. You know, if we do think there's gonna be similar applicants for the positions, it might, um, might be beneficial, but I, if I'm understanding right, the supervising investigator, policy analyst, uh, it sounds like those are going to be different skill sets and we'll probably be doing different outreach to different groups. But um, I mean, we're, we're fine either way. We have, you know, different people that can do the, the various searches based on their expertise. And so I, we're fine with whatever timetable you, you choose. Okay, we'll discuss that more next week than when Charmaine is there. And uh, then if, uh, if it's okay with everybody, I'd like to um, skip over the unfinished business for the time being and go to our new business and get that taken care of. And then we can go back as, as needed because we wanted to make sure we got done today the uh, selection of the uh, seven to 10 community organizations that will be invited to have a representative to participate on the uh, community uh, feedback panel. Um, and, um, and also, Liz, while you're here, we're going to need to, wait, either from you or Dave, get the confidentiality agreement that they're going to need to sign. Uh, because 
Yeah, go ahead, Liz. You're unmuted. Yeah, yeah, I can help with that. Um, I can put it together on seamless docs. Um, and this is for, remind me, so they're going to help as part of the interview process? So right. And so we're going to, the first step of the interview process is a community process. So we're going to have a community panel of uh, representatives from a seven to 10 community organizations uh, who are going to uh, provide us feedback. Um, uh, each of them will fill out a, a feedback form, which they'll submit to the interviewing committee. Um, and uh, and so prior, when we get to that point, and that'll be coming up uh, relatively soon uh, in, 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 no, in mid-June, um, we need to have the uh, confidentiality agreement for them to sign because some of the applicants uh, you know, may not want it public that they're applying for the position. Um, and I'm sure you're, that you probably have some from some other community panels that you've done. And then secondly, uh, we need to develop uh, the uh, feedback instrument, uh, which probably needs to be approved by, uh, you know, by HR, but we want this committee to be involved in the development of it. Um, and I think David indicated he would be able to assist with that as well. Yes, yeah, we can supply something. I'd be glad to certainly work with Liz and you know make something I think that certainly the, the city has worked with too. So if you can just give us some some deadlines on it, we'll 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 work with, with Liz. Okay. Well maybe at our next uh, mm -hmm. meeting, which probably will be in two weeks, since I'll be out of town next week. Uh, we can put on the agenda the uh, draft of the uh, of the feedback instrument so we can make sure that it uh, covers what we want want it to cover. Okay. I'm sorry, can you explain what is the feedback instrument again? It's, well, each of the participants in the uh, community panel will submit a, a survey of feedback, you know, provide written feedback on each of the applicants. Oh, okay. And... Uh, and it can be done with a rating scale and comments. I've seen it done different ways in with different groups that I've been involved in. Uh, but uh, typically what I've seen is that they have you know, seven or eight uh, questions about uh, the candidate and you rate them on a scale of one to 10 or whatever it is. And then you leave room for, uh, for comments. Um, and then those will be compiled and uh, submitted to the uh, interviewing committee. So they have the benefit of the community input prior to the uh, interview process. Doug and, and the commission, what would help me at least, how, how much time do you anticipate the panel devoting? That'll determine a little bit, obviously a number of questions and how we structure it. Is this like a couple hours or? Well, we're gonna do you know, one per, uh, per candidate. Uh, so they're gonna- yeah. And uh, I was guessing an hour per candidate. Uh, Charmaine okay. thought it might be a little bit longer That's than an hour, but I think so. you can usually okay. get, uh, you can, I think an hour is plenty of time to get a, a good grasp of what it, and we probably would have them uh, speak a little bit at the beginning about their own, um, own background, uh, their, um, mm -hmm. uh, their perspective on civilian oversight and so forth. So we can kind of give them an outline of uh, what we want them to speak about before we uh, open it up to uh, panel questions. And uh, Patrick. I've, uh, I've been on a lot of search committees and search advisory committees. And I think one of the things that is both humane for applicants and uh, efficient for these kinds of sessions um, is if we can um, did we just lose somebody? Oh, Nancy fell off. Okay. If uh, the seven to 10 individuals could actually provide a brief bio that we give to the finalists in advance, so they know who's on this panel and what their organization is. Um, otherwise, if we ask each of the seven to 10 people to introduce themselves and their organization at the beginning of a one hour meeting, we're going to be left with about 20 minutes for discussion, if that. So I would actually recommend we front load introductions and bios 
Um, that could just be a list of each person's bio, maybe a paragraph about the organization they're representing. And that should be given to the finalists in advance so they know who's on the panel. Does that make sense to everybody? I think that's a great idea. Uh, would the outreach chair be willing to uh, compile that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a wonderful idea. Uh, so, uh, so Patrick, what we what we do with these um, type of groups is we'll actually give like a candidate packet. Where what we'll do is we'll have like a short summary of the candidate qualifications, their history, things like that, kind of in a consistent format that we we can supply and it'll, it will attach, you know, their resumes, we'll attach uh, other pertinent documents that they have. And then we would put the questions that the, the committee is gonna ask in there. If that's what you're looking for, I mean, that's something we can certainly do. And again, I can work with Patrick and, and, and Liz and whoever on that, but- That's great. Have, yeah. Okay. yeah I, I, was, I was gonna suggest we also give them the questions in advance because in my experience, we get much more thoughtful answers if the candidates have some time to think about, you know, the, que the questions are gonna be asked. And it, it might be good to actually ask the community panel members, if you could ask these finalists one question, what would that question be? Um, you know, we don't have to necessarily include all those questions in the packet. Um, it, it's up to this committee, but it, it would be useful to get a sense from each committee, each rep or each panel member, um, what, you know, what for them is the most important question they want to make sure get asked, gets asked. Okay. And, um, and just to confirm, we're planning on doing these via Zoom. So we probably will send out uh, the, uh, the packets uh, as a PDF to all of the, uh, all the participants. Uh, Correct. Okay. And so thank you, I Patrick. Know. Oh, go ahead, Liz. I had a question for Patrick. When you were describing giving like a snapshot of the organization and title of the of the community panel members, you were meaning to provide that to the candidates themselves, right? So they know who they're Yeah, talking. so we're talking about two different packets. Two so packets. a candidate yeah. packet to the community panel members, but also a panel packet to the candidates with because the lists of each good. member and the list of questions that we intend to ask. Perfect. That's what I just wanted to clarify. I thought that's what you meant. Um, I think that's very helpful. Um, I also had one other comment about releasing the questions in advance. That's something that I would, um, I, and I don't want to like chime in with my own opinions, but I, I kind of do, but I've seen it um, um, given in advance first as the higher, the higher level, the position that I, that we go in the organization, at least on the, on the city side, I've seen less and less of information provided in advance because they want to see the ability to answer questions on the fly and quick the way it is kind of in real life. Um, I don't know if that's the will of this commission. I'm just throwing that in there that I've seen it go the other way, like not providing it in advance because they want to see like the ability to quickly and nimbly answer questions um, like you would if you were speaking to the media or um, other unprepared situations. Um, I had that to say. And then the other thing is the confidentiality agreement. Do you guys wish for me to sign that or do you want Charmaine to sign it? So I have it as the, the community member signs one side and a representative of the city signs on the other side. And that can be me from HR or it could be Charmaine. It should be a city employee. And I'm happy to do it. Just um, let me know. And then I, I'll just draft it. It becomes a survey link that anyone can share out. And then as soon as I see it, I sign it. I think it's fine for Liz to do it. Um, and I also agree with Liz, I don't think we necessarily need to give the, uh, the questions to the candidates in advance. We can give the, the uh, candidates a list of uh, topics you want them to cover in their introduction. Um, but uh, I think we want to give the feedback instrument to the panelists in advance so they know what kind of things to be looking for as they, uh, as they do the interview. So I see Kate and then Nancy. Thank you. Um, I also think there should be something in the in the panel packet about um, uh, conflict. Um, I suspect that some people on the panel may know some of the applicants, 
And so we may need to, to come up with some language about, um, you know, recuse, recusing yourself if you know somebody or at least acknowledging that so, so, something, something to that effect. Like, you know, we commonly do if, for example, we know a judicial officer that we're appearing in front of. So um, we probably need to, that's just my suggestion. Maybe Dwayne can come up with something about that. Do you like me giving you new work, Dwayne? <laughs> and uh, Liz or David, how's that normally been done in the past? I mean, what, one way of doing it may be simply to have them put on the feedback instrument so that, uh, you know, if they're, if they know the person, the people reading the feedback instrument will be able to, I know that. Uh, well, I, I think that should, I think that should come up front because I, I'm a little concerned, for example, I, I'm not going to be on the panel, but if I were on a panel and, and a friend of mine was an applicant and other people on the panel knew that I had a personal relationship with somebody, there's going to be problems from the outset. So I think there should, I think it needs to be an upfront recusal or disclosure of, um, uh, you know, maybe we're in the same organization. Maybe we have a personal relationship, maybe whatever. There, there needs to be some, some way to have that disclosure at the beginning to determine whether somebody should not be part of that interview process. Okay, and uh, Nancy? So I very much liked Patrick's idea of giving the questions to people ahead of time. And I understand what Liz is saying about asking questions just to see how somebody responds in real time. I would think we could do both. We would have maybe a half a dozen questions that we wanted them to think about ahead of time and answer. And then a couple of topics where we would have questions in our hold back that we would ask them in real time to respond to. I, I think you need both things. That's all, thank you. Okay. So we can, we can we can work a little bit more on the structure of it, but th those are all good suggestions. Um, um, Kate, the when I've seen it in the past, and when someone knew, they um, they said, "I won't be I, I know you know Brandon. I won't be um, providing ratings." And with on Zoom, they could actually even fully drop off the call for that portion of the interview if they wanted to be really transparent about it. Like, oh, since I know Brandon, I'll be dropping off. I'll rejoin the committee in the next, when the next candidate comes along. But um, I see them say it right off the bat, like as soon as the person joins the room. Uh, I mean, that that's the kind of thing I was suggesting just to, but, but that it should be in the packet that goes to the panel so they know that's. Well, and, and, and maybe in the confidentiality agreement itself too, uh, so that they understand they have a responsibility to, uh, to that. and Nancy, is your hand still up or do you have something else? Okay. Then uh, let's uh, I'm trying to move it along so we can get this accomplished uh, in our time frame here. Uh, Patrick was doing uh, some uh, homework of uh, contacting uh, community organizations, and I saw the uh, email that he sent out to his community list, and uh, hopefully he got some responses, and hopefully he got enough responses. And um, ideally, you got the seven to ten responses, and we won't have to do a lot of whittling down. So. Okay, so to be clear, I haven't yet asked all of the organizations if they're willing to send someone, but I have gotten, so I'm going to try to share screen to show you the list. Um, need to make sure I am sharing the right list or the right document. Hang on. There we go. Okay, so there are 12 organizations that either nominated themselves or were nominated by others. Um, and that's the list on the screen in alphabetical order. The asterisk indicates that the organization nominated itself, which indicates that they would be willing to send someone. Um, the others that shouldn't in any way suggest that the others wouldn't be willing to send someone. Um, this is just uh, the difference between people who've been nominated or groups that have been nominated and groups that actually wrote me and said, hey, we want to be on that list. Um, I will say that one of these organizations is of, and I won't, uh, uh, the, the, so Allied Gardens, um, the person who contacted me indicated that um, 
the group is very small and this person wasn't sure that they would be able to send someone. Um, and I believe that, that one of that small group of people, um, and this may be true for all the groups, but may also be applying for the job, which would be a conflict of interest in terms of participation. Um, but, you know, we have 12 groups that do represent both um, the, the, part, the, the organizations within San Diego who've been most consistently and thoroughly engaged with this process. Um, and there's also a nice spread in terms of um, the different diversities of San Diego. Um, you know, there, there, are 12, there are 12 groups on here. We said seven to 10. My first question was, is 12 all that different from 10 when it comes down to it? I bet David and Liz will shake their fingers at me and say, yes, 12 is very different from 10. Um, so one question, you know, one thing we could do is just contact all 12 groups and say, is this something you can do? Is there someone who's willing to do it? Um, is it something you're interested in doing? Um, and if all 12 groups say yes, then we have 12 people on the panel, or we can remove two groups now. Um, Wait, it's, kind, it's kind of a shame because it's hard <laughs> if that's what we're going to do. It feels very strange to remove just two groups. I, if we're going to do that, I wish we had gotten 50 <laughs> group nominations. Um, but this is where we are. Okay. Well, I would say, well, a couple of things. Uh, we need to make sure that all the groups understand what the time commitment is. Right. Uh, and it's been my experience in the past that sometimes, especially if you're doing a interviews of different candidates on different days because we're probably going to have we're going to try to have you know five to seven applicants uh, so we're not going to have it all in one time um, you know there may be some individuals who uh, aren't able to come to all set say we have seven aren't able to come to all seven but they can come to five um, and so if we have 12 groups it would keep the size of the group you know, approximately the uh approximately the same um and um i do think it i mean it, it this, these are the groups that uh, have been most involved uh, i don't know much about the uh, ally gardens of grantville community council although i like the idea that we have a uh, a community council involved in this list um uh, and uh, so other thoughts kate your hands up uh, I think we should use all of these groups, and I, I agree with Doug. I think it's really possible that that whoever the designated representative is may not be able to attend all of the five to seven meetings. But I think that certainly the people who have reached out and said we want to do it, yes. And I will say that you know the National Lawyers Guild also said we want to do it because <laughs> we oh. already have a person who's volunteered to do it. Oh, great! I didn't um, get an email so from them. So we get an but... asterisk. And um, uh, I'm quite sure that Mid City Can is uh, in, will be willing to do that. And you know, so the couple others that, that you haven't heard back from, um, we'll see if they provide people. But I think this is a a good um, slice of the uh, activist community in San Diego and people that are uh, interested in and at least most of these groups have been involved in working on this issue. And Patrick, would, were there Latinx groups on your uh, email list? I assume there were. Oh yeah, there are, the, there are over a hundred organizations on that list, um, in addition to many, many, many individuals who are a part of lots of other organizations. So it, it went to, it, it went to probably okay. every, every group you can think of and many groups you, don't know about. Okay. Well, as long as they were invited, we don't need to necessarily reach out to try to increase the list. Um, but I think we have a consensus then uh, that we can invite all 12 to have a representative. And we also need to make it clear, Patrick, that we need a representative who will be a consistent rep one representative from each group, you know, so they can't send somebody to one interview and somebody to a different interview because we want them to be able to uh, compare the candidates. 
Okay, I'm, my next step will be to write them all and confirm interest and have them nominate someone. And then I'll start talking to each of the people who gets identified about um, the time commitment and so on. Okay, and do you mind communicating directly with David with the name and contact information for the list? Because he'll be in charge of the scheduling once we get there. Of course, yeah. Okay. Maybe you can tell them that after uh, several hours of deliberation, we selected their organization and <laughs> the, the honor of selection. Yes. Okay. Well, that uh, didn't take as much time as I feared. Uh, actually, I was kind of hoping that it would come out exactly the way it did. That, uh, and so we are proceeding there. So now we can. Um, and before we get back to the unfinished business, is it okay with everybody if we take next week off since I will be in Florida and then re resume meeting the following uh, Friday and go back to our 1230 on Friday meetings? Any objection to that? Is that okay with your schedule, Patrick? Yes. Okay, then that'll be our game plan. Um, so now we can go back to... Uh, the issue Sorry, that, you said Friday at 12.30, right? 12.30, right. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. And so now we can go back to our unfinished business and the thing that's been on our agenda for a long period of time waiting for Dwayne to be able to join us is the investigation uh, procedures. Um, and uh, in a discussion that uh, Dwayne and uh, Charmaine and I had, uh, I guess earlier this week or last week, it all kind of blends together in my mind. I guess it was last week. Um, he indicated that uh, he was willing to, uh, as we had hoped, to take the lead in, in drafting them. And he agreed that the uh, CLURB's uh, guidelines provided a good uh, starting template uh, for, our, for our processes. Um, we had a uh, long discussion. Uh, I made a long discussion. We had a discussion at this committee meeting last week about the need for having a MOUs, not only with the police department, uh, but with uh, the other agencies who will be doing uh, investigations of uh, officer involved shootings uh, to make sure that we have cooperation from those agencies. And he wasn't convinced that we necessarily need to do that. And so I'll let him talk about that. And so uh, let me just at this point, let me turn it over to. Uh, to Dwayne to kind of give us an overview of uh, the process of coming up uh, with investigation procedures or protocols. Okay, so. okay, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I've been sitting in the wing for a long time and been monitoring what's been going on. I, I think that the, the, the protocol for the standard operating procedures regarding investigations is gonna be an interesting uh, process. I will have something for you definitely, and it won't take me long. I'm working on them now, uh, probably within a couple of weeks, I will have for you uh, some suggested uh, SOPs. Now, you, you have to keep in mind that I'm drafting these in somewhat of a vacuum, because until the implementation of ordinance is finalized, we don't know. So there is going to be a question there. The other, th the other question uh, involves the fact that we don't have investigators or an investigation supervisor yet. So as soon as the investigators come in, they'll have some input. But what I, what I would like to provide for you is a framework for how these investigations are typically done in a police department, you know, working in connection with internal affairs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also, as we know, the investigative protocols and procedures are going to have to go through meet and confer. So just like I indicated, we will be in meet and confer. But what I like to do is give, give the, the commission a template uh, for moving forward. What, what I intend to do is basically walk through how the investigations relative to the investigations the commission is going to be doing. Uh, should take place. And I, I, I'll rely on my experience as an internal affairs investigator for police departments and then working for police departments to figure out exactly what that protocol should be. Um, in terms of the, the concern over the countywide uh, OIS MOUs, yeah, I'm not convinced that we're going to need um, 
you know, reciprocal M MOUs with the County of San Diego and with the, the city of Chula Vista because the investigations that they will be doing are criminal investigations at the direction of Summer Stephan, at the, the, the direction of the district attorney. No citizen, no, not, not us as citizens, nor even the police department will have superior access to that information. So the reason that the investigations that the sheriff's department or the city of Chula Vista will be doing on behalf of the San Diego PD, the reason they're doing it is to keep the San Diego PD out of it and to basically bifurcate it and make sure that that is a sanitized investigation for criminal purposes. And when you see my investigative template, investigative template, uh, the template I'm gonna propose for you, you'll understand, this will become clear. The information that an administrative agency like the San Diego PD can access and can get is going to be, excuse me, it's gonna be different than the information that the Sheriff's Department is gonna access and, and, and have entitlement to. Where I do believe that the uh, commission as well as San Diego PD, what, what information I do believe we should have is information on the scene when an incident takes place, you should be out there. The commission should have access to the same information that the San Diego Police Department has, but uh, asking for information greater than that uh, is, is something that we really do not have a right to, even the police department may not have a right to because the district attorney is the chief investigator criminal investigator uh, uh, for the county. It will not, I don't believe it's gonna hinder the work of the commission because the work of the commission is to analyze the administrative aspect of these incidents, make recommendations, make disciplinary recommendations, et cetera, et cetera. It's not gonna hinder the work we have. What we need to do is ensure that the ordinance, and this is one of the things I, I you know, uh, uh, Doug and, and Brandon, I did a draft. I did a draft letter for you know for you that I that was sent out yesterday regarding this whole meet and confer and the whole implementation ordinance issue. The thing the thing that has to take place is uh, we need to and, and what the city council can do. The city council <clears throat> can direct the police department to give the commission access to certain information. All right, at certain points, they can do that. And the commission can go back to the police department based upon this ordinance and say, you owe us that. We can direct that. We don't need an MOU or anything like that. We can get that information and say, you, you, you are responsible for providing this information. That should be our charge. If we have to go out and negotiate the MOUs with the county and with Chula Vista, just like it took these folks a year to do it. You know, it, it's just gonna, you know, we could be spinning our wheels, you know, for a long, long time. I think that what we do is take charge of what we have, come up with our investigative guidelines and protocols, realizing it's going to be somewhat in flux until you get your investigators in there, until you get the implementation ordinance in there, and then until it goes through meet and confer. But we will certainly, I, I certainly want to give you a, a, a place to start and, and something to think about. I do think that the CLERB guidelines for the investigatory hearings that the commission will do, although a little bit different, is a good format. They, they, that is a good, um, uh, that's something we can build on. But I'll, I'll have several recommendations for you in terms of, of the standard operating procedures uh, relative to investigations in, uh, in just, in, in fairly short order. Doug, you're muted. Yeah, Charmaine muted me because my phone went off. <laughs> uh, Patrick. Uh... Yeah. Duane, thank you so much. I, we're all just so happy to have you here and your expertise and experience is going to be, it's just, it already feels like a beacon um, that uh, that's going to help this process along. So thank you so much. Um, so one of the reasons that we are concerned about that countywide MOU, um, I'll, I just want to explain some of the context and thinking behind this. Um, so last year, we brought in um, not only former IA investigators, but also um, investigators for other uh, commissions and oversight boards to talk to them about what they do. Um, and I know Charmaine will share some of those names um, that I, they're always willing to talk to us and help us out. So 
they, they would be a useful resource too. One of them who has spent all of his career, I believe, doing oversight in the, as an investigator in the Bay Area, stressed a couple of really important things for independent investigations. And I do understand the difference between the criminal investigation and the administrative investigation. But he said under California law, regardless of that, you need to make sure that your investigators have crime scene access. As, you know, as soon as investigators from the criminal investigation have shown up, our investigator needs to have access to that crime scene as well. And then the other um, aspect of this that is apparently critical under California's POBAR laws is that our investigators need to be present and able to participate as part of the first interview that happens with subject officers. And the, the thinking there apparently, and please correct me if I'm wrong, anybody else, um, is that under those POBAR laws, if, if an officer is interviewed a second time about the same situation, then that officer must be given access to the full investigation files in advance of that interview. Um, and so our understanding was that because historically SDPD has done the criminal investigation of its own officers in OISs resulting in um, a death, uh, we would, this would all be a part of our MOU with SDPD because they would have control of the original crime scene. They would be doing, conducting the first interviews. The criminal division would be under, or the homicide division would be doing those first interviews. With the countywide MOU, the reason that we suspect we need those independent, those separate MOUs with all these other agencies is that in order to get access to the crime scene that the criminal investigators have control of, and in order to get access to those first interviews, we would have to now arrange that with Chula Vista and the county sheriff. Um, so does that Log does that logic make sense in the context of San Diego, or do you is, is something in there off? Well, Patrick, you have you raised so many great issues. I mean, I, I wish I could pick them one by one, but but let me let me see where I can start. Uh, first of all, I agree that on a critical incident, and that will be in your investigative protocol. On a critical incident, you need to have access to the scene. Okay, so when something happens. Uh, and and uh, keep in mind that under the MOU that's worked out with the county and the PD, uh, when a critical incident first takes place, that's still San Diego PD's scene, okay, until, uh, and, and they're out there, and we should be out there, okay, you should be out there, the investigators for the, the commission should be out there, so I totally agree there. At some point in time, it turns over to the sheriff's department, let's just say the sheriff's department. In terms of the first interview of the officer, okay, I'm gonna disagree with the investigator under POBAR and I, I will tell you why. Uh, the first interview of the officer to the extent that there is something that is gonna be investigated criminally, uh, you know, quote unquote, um, the, I don't think you need to be there for that, for the investigation, for example, the sheriff's department would do of the officer or would be involved of, relative to the officer. If San Diego PD is not there and IA is not there, we can't be there. Okay, so that's, you know, that's just the way it's going to work. But here's the deal. San Diego is going, the Sheriff's Department will be conducting a criminal investigation. The Police Department will be conducting an administrative investigation and, and, and the CPP will be investigating or doing a, an administrative investigation. Nine, I, I'm going to tell you, you don't know how often it is, but in most cases, when a police officer is involved in a critical shoot, and even other officers are on the scene, a lot of times they invoke their rights to Miranda. They invoke their rights to silence. They do not talk. They don't volunteer a statement. So when they are interviewed by the Sheriff's Department, most times, Rick Pinker, Bradley Field, all of them are going to tell those guys when they are Mirandized, because the Sheriff's Department has to Mirandize them they're gonna invoke their rights to silence. They're gonna say, I'm not gonna provide a statement. So you're not gonna get a statement from them anyway. Sometimes they volunteer a statement, but a lot of times they won't do that. 
when the, when, when, the, when the Internal Affairs Department has their chance to do the investigation and the CPP have their chance to do the investigation, you will order that officer to provide a statement. You're going to give that officer what we call a Garrity or a LIBAR admonition. You're going to order that officer to pro provide a statement under the threat of termination. Then the officer will give the statement. So what happens is the investigation that you'll be doing, you're going to have actually greater access to a lot of information. Uh, to the information because you're going to have not only the information from the officer, but you're going to have all the information from the crime scene. So you'll have greater in, uh, access at that time. The, the, danger okay. of, the danger of getting out there when they're doing the criminal investigation is, and, and the district attorney controls that scene. You know, they don't want the, you know, us out there, they don't want people out there that could contaminate the scene or somehow mess up something. And the other, the, and the other reason why you want to bifurcate those investigations is because the police department really can't, on one hand, they want to they wanna get the statement from the officer. So they want to order the officer, officer to provide a statement. But at the same time, if they're trying to do the criminal investigation, one house has a statement, the other house side of the house can't have the statement. Otherwise, there can be no prosecution. So yeah. it, it's, a, it's a nuance. Um, I, I'm sorry to go into this. No, no, no. This is, this is incredibly helpful. And I'm remembering now that because of the compulsion Miranda doesn't hold in administrative investigation. So the, right. off, the subject can, officer is compelled to respond. Yes, now that now, statement, that compelled statement that, that you can get, that the police department can get, cannot, cannot be used in a criminal. No. That's right. And if, and if you swap, and if, if, if the two mix, you've destroyed them the, the, the opportunity to do a criminal. That's a right. Criminal. So and that's, other, oh, fact, sorry, go ahead. The, the other thing I wanted to say is that the, the notion that if the officer is re-interviewed, they get access to all the information. That's not true. What they get, what happens is if you interrogate under Pobar, if you interview an officer one time, and then you decide you're going to interview an officer a second time, the officer has to have access to the first interview. They have to have access to the recording or to their first interview. Uh, they don't have to, they, you don't have to give them access to the whole investigation. See what I mean? So if I interview oh. an officer, if I interview an officer one time, first of all, they always have access. They can always get an access, or a copy of their own interrogation. But if you want to re-interview an officer for a second time, you have to make sure that they have a copy of everything they said in the first interview. But you okay. don't have to give them the whole investigation. So that's a, that's that's a different answer than what we were told in the past. Yeah. Um, I'm also hearing you say, and I just want to, this helps sort things out in my mind. So I want to make sure I understand you correctly. That rule, what the, the rule of a second interview requires certain disclosures is under POBAR. And POBAR, from what I'm hearing from you, is limited to the administrative interviews. It doesn't count the criminal interviews. Yeah, it, it actually, it actually uh, affects both of them because under POBAR, if an officer is suspected or if there's a likelihood or any chance that an officer can be criminally charged, you have to Mirandize under POBAR. And, you know, so POBAR, some of the rights, POBAR is really for the administrative act, at, you know, the administrative issue. And POBAR also says that if there is a chance that there could be a criminal uh, event involved, then the administrative investigation That's is sweet. told. So it has, it has uh -huh. some, it, it really is for the administrative investigation. You're right, but it has some issues or some sure. aspects that apply to the criminal also. But, but you're, you're, what you're telling us is that this, that what we've heard from investigators in the past, that a second interview requires full disclosure of everything in the file, that that's actually not accurate. Yeah. Um, and it's only, it's only that they would be given access to the full, I guess, audio and transcript of that first interview or interrogation. And that's, yeah, and that's typically what you'll do. If you interview them again, you're going to give them information related to, you know, Pobar says you have to give them, uh, you know, access or you have to advise them as to the nature, the general nature of the investigation. But there are some things in these investigations that are kept confidential. The, the only thing about it is if you have an, uh, information you withhold from the officer, you can't later use that confidential information against them to discipline, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So typically speaking, if you're gonna interview them again, then you have to make sure that they have, you, before you do, you have to give them a copy of their tape, their first interview. You know, That's really helpful, thank really you. The thing you have to do. 
Sorry for that long-winded response. I'm sorry. No, it, it's so clarifying. Thank you. Helpful because I think a lot of us had the same questions based on our previous conversations. So maybe we can leave it here and uh, we can have uh, Dwayne work on this for a couple of weeks. And, and there are some things in the list of the outline that I provided uh, to you or we provided to you, Dwayne, mm -hmm. that go beyond just the investigation protocols. Yes. And uh, so, and we may do it piece by piece, um, yeah. but uh, we are so happy to have you here and uh, we're looking forward to having a work product that we can start asking questions about and so forth. And I think we'll, you know, we're able to now move ahead. Right. Doug, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying, I looked at your outline and I'm trying to touch on just about everything you all had in that outline. So hopefully I do it right. So, okay. Um, let's go back to the agenda. And as I said, I, I have kind of a pretty hard stop at 430 and, uh, uh, so we've covered uh, A and B. Um, I think we can postpone this with you know, further discussion of uh, the models of review by the Permanent Commission uh, and the uh, D is still on hold for the time being and uh, E is still on hold. So I think that we're good for today. Uh, and so next week, we're going to talk about uh, investigation procedures, and we're going to uh, talk about uh, the um, feedback instrument uh, for our community panel. Is there anything else we need to talk about uh, two weeks from today? Okay. So I think we have our agenda for, for next week. And uh, it's two weeks, right? Yeah, for two weeks from today. Yes, thank you. Or tomorrow. Right. Or and, then, and, then, and I will see uh, Charmaine and Brandon at our. Uh, it's Thursday? No. Who, who said Thursday? We're not, we're, not, we're not meeting tomorrow, Nancy. This, today's no, meeting I, was I know for this that. Week. The, oh. But the meeting is on a Friday. And you keep. You yeah, guys, yeah, we're, yeah, we're going. Two weeks from today. It's two weeks from tomorrow, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. Two weeks okay. from tomorrow. Just checking. Okay. Uh, yesterday was today and <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, anything else for today then? So I think this is a very productive meeting and uh, I will see everybody in a week and a day uh, with the exception of Charmaine and uh, Brandon, uh, we're doing our dry run for the budget uh, hearing next, next week. Okay, well, goodbye everybody, take care. Good night or whatever. <laughs>